today I'm going to talk to you about PHP and how we can use it to solve complex problems in production. So the topics uh, we cover are tracing and the different kinds of tracing because usually there is a mix between the terminology between trace buffering, aggregation, sampling. Then we talk about what is a TNG and why we want to use it for this kind of uh, use cases. And then we discuss the four main modes of TNG and how to configure them and why they are useful for our various use cases. So my name is Jenny Fossi, I'm a software developer at Fisher. Uh, we develop and support the uh, STNG. So I work on the STNG kernel and the space tracer and bubble trace with the text converting the software. And also the author and maintainer of the latest tracker and STNG analysis project. We'll talk about that uh, during the presentation. So the first kind of tracer that I want to talk about is trace buffering. So that's usually what we refer to as tracing. It's just a uh, fast and efficient logger. So you take the instrumented code and it generates logs. But the difference between uh, normal logging and tracing is that it generates usually a huge amount of trace. And that's why we use buffering, because we want to extract as much information as possible and make sure it's uh, complete and you have the full idea of what's happening on your system. So it's usually really application specific. It's meant for developers and it's created by the developers. So it's really just for debugging your product usually. So the common tracing tools in the next RF trace, which is in the kernel. Perf can be used as trace buffering also, but it's not the main mode. And of course, for the engine. So the buffering use cases is to understand complex problems. So you need as much information because you want the low level data and then to be able to process the trace offline just with the data and see what was happening. So it can be used to solve uh, concurrency issues, race conditions, or drivers issue, low level problems. You also have hardware tracing which does this kind of uh, trace buffer. So it's usually considered the last line of defense because when you are at the end of using a tracer, that's because you didn't find the solution with a simpler tool before. So that's usually why it's not that popular to, to use a tracer and why you always have to re rediscover how it works because you usually don't use that every day. But with, with a, what I'm going to show you today, you will see that it can be used in production for cloud and monitoring usage. The second type of uh, tracing is trace aggregation. So we should have heard about T-Trace, that's what they did. So it's the same uh, source of information, it's usually trace points in the camera or dynamic source. But instead of logging the data, you aggregate them, you extract parameters, and then you output uh, reports. So it can be uh, averages, min, max, it can be also used to just give a profile of I.O. Or the kind of high operation for a specific file. So it can be reconfigured to make sure you understand one system, but it's at runtime. So when you unload the program, program, you get the report, and that's it. You cannot go back to time and see what was happening. You just have this source of data. So it's just aggregation. So the common tracing tool, aggregation tools on Linux are system tap. Now we have eBPF, which can be uh, which you can use VCC, which helps creating uh, user space program that uh, loads eBPF code, and uh, latency tracker, which is a tool that we work on. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. And the third kind of uh, tracing tool I want to talk about is sampling or profiling. So it just takes the current activity of a system at a very particular uh, time. So it can be time based or it can be uh, when the counter overflows. So you could have Sample every 1,000 instruction, just what's happening on the system at the moment, the, the counter overflow. And it's used to extract statistics, but mainly on spots. So if you have a first per stop, you want to see exactly what was running on the system, and it usually helps you find what was the activity and why, uh, where your code was at that moment. So for ITNG, the main parts that it's a fast camera tracer, as fast as F-Trace. The main difference is that XTNG also extracts the payload of the system calls. 
that trace also the dust outputs, the line of the, the parameters, but if you have pointers in there, it doesn't de reference them. So HTMD does that. It's also a fast user space tracer. It doesn't rely on system calls for each uh, trace point. So compared to tracing or uh, logging, where you would have at least one right system call every one, every time you want to output a line, in a, uh, a TNG is in memory. And when the buffers are full, we extract them on this. And it's designed to run in production environments. So it's not just a debugging tool when you don't have any more choice. You can do that on the line. And it's filled with a lot of tools for post-processing increases and the batch or graphical. We will see some examples later. So HTNG can generate a lot of events. If you configure a default system with the camera tracing on this laptop that does nothing, you can generate about 54,000 events per second. And if you run the same configuration on the server that's not busy, you will generate 2.7 million events per second. So it's 95 megabytes of trace per second. So that's a lot, a lot of lines and you have to process them after. So the default mode is maybe not for everyone and we will see why we have the other modes because and why they are useful. So the first mode, like I said, is the default. It's just extract the trace buffers and write them on disk or on the network. So you can have a STNG relay that just waits for data packets to come. So if you don't have space on your local system, you can send the trace remotely. So you are only limited by disk space and your willingness to process big traces. But the, the main use case is that you want as much information as possible. You don't know what you are looking for. You want to get just a big picture of what the system is doing. And maybe sometimes you just don't know when the problem happens. So you want to record everything and then do the post-processing. So, and it's also used in uh, continuous integration systems, Jenkins, uh, where you can just record the trace while the tests are running and then you can post process if something weird happens. So, to create a, a disk or streaming session, you just create the session, enable all events, start the session, you wait for the activity or the problem to happen, then you stop the session and then you can process the trace. So, you cannot process the trace while it's running. You really have to stop before being able to, to access the data. So it can be it can take some time. Uh, if you take a real world example of a disk and streaming mode, we have the full uh, write up of this case on the, on the link at the end. But basically, the, it's a use case where users complain that the website is uh, you don't know why, you don't know when, just sometimes they complain. And the standard monitoring tools usually don't uh, record this kind of activity. It will just take a sample every minute of how many packets per second or even what's the average you can see. But usually you don't see micro spikes in the monitoring tools. And that's where this kind of observation tool comes really handy. Because now what we do is that we record every I.O. operation scheduling and system of activity of the web server. And specify, and specify only uh, a process. And when some bad thing reports a problem, then you can go to the tool, run some uh, post processing tools, and extract really detailed uh, information. So that's, that's just an example. It's not meant to be really, really more right now. But just to give you an idea, if it's the IO latency stuff, so it takes the trace and extract the top, the top four for the open, read, write, and sync kind of operations. And we see two items here, and we, the first one is the open of the PHP file, session file. So that's the web server that's trying to create a new session on the disk. And it took five, or around 500 milliseconds to open this file. And if we look at the bottom, we also see that there is a sync that's happening on the system at the same time. So it's working. The, the disk and the, app, the uh, Apache server cannot create a session file, so it's just hanging. So that the kind of micro spike that we wouldn't see with uh, usual monitoring tools, but that's possible. And after that, if you look at the blog post, if you want more details, we dig really deep into how we find how we found this and 
how to explain where the thing comes from. The second one I want to talk about is the live mode. So it's basically the same uh, process. You create a session, but the main difference is that you attach to the session. So you can process the trace while it's still running. So that's a big difference because the other, other kids will have to stop the trace and then process it. And live can attach to it and start processing the data. The, another difference that, that you can use that in our model of school is that the trace file size and trace file count. So you can record it. So if you don't want to keep the full history on disk, you can limit uh, the disk space that's used by the, uh, the trace. So you attach to the session, you can process it, but it's still writing to disk, but at least you have a bounded usage, uh, disk usage. Live mode in itself is useful for low throughput logging because you don't want to read 54,000 events per second on the console. That's stupid. So if you configure really specific events that are really low throughput, maybe you want to attach to a live session and see the events when they come, when they happen. But it's also used for distributed and embedded system or monitoring out of them. So you send a trace to a relay and then you do your analysis on the relay. So you don't have too much impact on the system that is being traced. You just use it to trace, send packets, and then out of them you have a, a system that processes it. So the big difference between the first mode and this one is that you have to attach life on the create operation and that you can use that to do while the trace is running instead of having to stop and then do. And of course you can send also the trace to a remote server from for the bounded disk usage, you can configure your channels to be only, for you. in this example, four files of 10 megabytes. So it will rotate on those four files for each CPU on this channel. Uh, and that will you have 40 megabytes per CPU at most of the disk usage. And of the story also, of course, so you have to see how you want to process it. The third mode, well, one of the most interesting is the snapshot mode. So instead of having the traces for uh, buffers in memory, then we extract the data right into disk. In this mode, we don't write the disk by default. So we just trace the memory, memory buffer, and that's it. It's just writing events, and when the other events, uh, when new events want to come and the buffers are full, they just overwrite all the events. So it's low overhead because instead of doing I.O., we just write memory. And when you want to extract the trace, you just type a CMD snapshot record. It takes the content of the buffers in memory and write them to this. And then you can do your post processing. So you can configure triggers in your applications or any kind of monitoring tool to just, when you detect something, just record the snapshot and you get the backlog of maybe a few seconds before the incident happens. So you can use that. Uh, we have the to configure the core file handler. So when you generate the core dump, you can also trigger a CNG snapshot record, and then you get the full activity right before the segmentation for that. Of course, if since we are writing in memory and overwriting the data, the time span inside the snapshot depends on how much memory you want to dedicate to the, to the tracing session. But that's really something that you can configure, and depending on your event rates, and size, you will have a uh, big or small snapshot at the end. So the use cases are for the test location. So when you know when the high latency is detected, you can trigger the snapshot. You can also use as profiling tool because you can say every five minutes I want to see the history of the last few seconds and just see what was happening on the system. Of course, uh, computer integration also can be used because when the worker detects an error, you can just record the snapshot and at the end you will be able to process the crash and why it happened. The difference between the default mode and the snapshot mode is that on the creation you specify that that snapshot and that's it. After that, you just create your session and then order and start the session and when you want, you just type it in the snapshot record. It doesn't push the data from memory, so if you just uh, type of CNG snapshot record twice, you just get approximately the same snapshot in just a few microseconds later. So if you want a concrete example, I think we are 
monitoring the website with the latency tracker, which is just an aggregation tool that uh, just on the user's trace points and just computes the time first byte between the receive or request the first send, actual send of data. And we just track the latency of uh, this operation. And we, from the graphs, we see some time we see spikes. So that's fully automated at this point, compared to the first use case where we had to wait for users to report. In this case, it's can be fully automated with an aggregation group. So we detect spikes, and that now, now we just have some code, we can extract the snapshot every time the spike is detected, and then run post processing on just a small trace. So it's a, uh, I think we have one second of the story, so just before, one second before the highlight is happening. So we can see the, the data. So if we look, just that meant to be really boring, but just to give you an idea, it's in Grafana, we have metrics plotted for each uh, latency measure by the latency tracker. And every time you see a bigger line that's above the, the, the baseline, we also have annotations with a small uh, orange triangle. And if, if you click on this orange triangle, you get reports that are fully automated. Yeah, so the latency tracker detects the high latency, extracts the snapshots, sends it to the server, the server pro processes the trace to extract the profile here, it's the IO latency frequency distribution, and, and then it's annotated to the graph monitoring. So you just click on the link and you can get a full picture of what was happening exactly at that time. So here we in the latency uh, frequency, two outliers in the, in the range of 54 microseconds compared to everything that's in the range of five microseconds. So and then we have tools to dig into the time periods but I let you look at the documentation if you want. And finally the last mode that we have been working on uh, for the past uh, eight months it's the uh, rotation mode. So it's expected to be released in March twenty eighteen. It's currently under review. And the idea of the rotation mode is that combines the normal tracing mode, which is just uploading a trace on disk with the snapshot mode, which is creating small traces. So now we write to disk all the time, and whenever we want, we can just type a TNG rotate, and it takes the current uh, chunk of data and writes it into a separate folder, and the trace continues to write on disk. So in the end, you can configure a figure that every minute uh, executes TNG rotate and you would have self-contained one minute trace instead of having a huge trace that covers the whole tracing session or small snapshots. So it's uh, in between and again it's dependent on the use case. Sometimes snapshots are better for the other use cases but this is really useful. Also you can use it to compress the trace. We have customers that trace all the time and traces become <coughs> huge. So they want to every hour just rotate the trace, compress it, and, and keep it for storage. So if they need some time to use the trace, we can just get uh, from the storage and process it. Instead of having to stop the session, and then you can lose events in between sessions. Uh, with this mode, you don't lose any events. Just switching the directory, and you can use the trace as a really small self container so it can run indefinitely depending on the disk size. But if you, if you can also just rotate, process the trace, generate uh, reports like that, and then scout the trace, you don't keep too much storage uh, on it. And so the use cases are continuous monitoring because you can do that to every minute, extract really low level data. If you use filters to see, you just want some IO metrics from Apache. It's more basic you choose how long it takes. And uh, also for post processing because sometimes just generating this graph from a 10 second trace can take more than 10 seconds depending on the, the load and the number of events. So with this kind of process you can just extract the snapshot, send it to a worker that will do the post processing of the trace and continue working on the software. And then, so creating a trace is basically just like creating a, a disk session, just create a model. And after the start, when the activity 
is running, then you can just type it in the row page and you can use the path of what was the data between the start and the row page. Then if you wait a bit and re-execute the row page, you will get the path to the action between the now and the previous rotation. So you will really get the full picture of what was happening on the stem between the two row pages. And then we have two, we have the trace compass, which is a graphical tool. We want to look at the data graphically and see something we can read around it on the, on the projector. But it gives you a way to explore by process or by results or CPU interrupts. The tool is you have the histogram, all kinds of graphical and review. And we are also working on a new tool to extend this scope, which is also a post processing tool to be able to really look into a trace and find what you want to do. Those are especially useful for race conditions. You don't want statistics like with the tools I presented before. You really want to see the full timeline at the nanosecond scale and really see what was happening, what was running on the system, why this process got to uh, Maybe you will see interrupts that are preventing a process from running. You will see everything from the it's really enjoyable tool and you want smaller traces because that can take ages to process this kind of uh, snapshots or rotations are really good for all this kind of So in conclusion, FTG allows to extract low-level hybrid information from production environments. It's uh, efficient camera in the space places. Can, the, the two traces are really separate, but at the end you can merge them and see the camera events in respect to the user space, you will see the full time uh, frame. Uh, it can be used for monitoring and for investigation. We know uh, a few companies that use it in telecommunication and automotive environments also. And uh, there are multiple ways where it's configured in G. And depending on your use case, you can just select the one that is most interesting for you. So, if you have any questions,